Thank you very much for joining us tonight for the inaugural John C. Friel X Talks. My name is Emily Keenan, and as the editor-in-chief of this very weekly, I'll be your MC for this evening. I'd like to welcome you tonight on behalf of the Students' Union, the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership, and this very weekly. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are here tonight in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. While none of our speakers will be addressing matters of indigenous justice and decolonization, it is important that we keep reconciliation in our minds as we reflect on our theme of justice this evening. Before we begin, I would also like to acknowledge a special guest present with us this evening and to offer a bit of background about the late Judge John C. Friel, whose legacy we honor here tonight. Judge Friel's son, Mr. Eric Friel, has traveled to Antigonish tonight to be with us for this inaugural event. I'd like to invite Mr. Friel up to the stage to say a few words on behalf of the Friel family. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Friel, uh, class of uh, 2000. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight for the, the first annual John C. Friel, John Korean Friel uh, X Talk series. Uh, a little bit about myself uh, I'm a police officer. Uh, I have I only have two suits. I have this suit, and everyone has a gun. And I forgot my notes in the suit with the gun, so bear with me. I'll do my best to get this, uh, get through this without a hitch. Uh, I, I work in uh, in Shediac, New Brunswick. It's a little town just outside of Moncton, where I live with my family, uh, my wife Melissa, who was a class of 2002, and my three daughters, uh, Claire, Emily, and Leah, who future ex grads. We have their their uh, applications filled out. <laughs> we got to wait about 10 years. A little, bit, a little bit about John C. Friel. Who, who is this guy that, uh, that you, you see on the posters? Uh, he's a, he was a proud, a proud wearer of an X-ring with a 1970 on it, the class of 1970, which he, he wore proudly until, uh, until the day of his death in uh, 2016. Uh, he master's degree in, uh, at Queen's University and a law degree at uh, UNB uh, in New Brunswick, where he practiced uh, criminal law for over 30 years, 31 years in uh, both Grand Falls and Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, after that, in uh, 2009, he was appointed judge to the uh, Miramichi Provincial Court in New Brunswick, where he, he sat as a, as a provincial court judge uh, until, uh, until he was uh, forced to retire in November 2015. Uh, he was a man that cared for justice. Uh, he, he, worked in that, he worked in the justice system, and he was passionate about it. Uh, Myself, you know, I'm ecstatic that the, the first annual X Talk series is about justice. Uh, it's a field that I work in, and yeah, I'm a cop. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of it's like criminal justice. We're arresting people, uh, but we see people of all walks of life every day. Uh, a lot of people at the lows, lows are life. You know, social problems, economic problems, uh, dealing with youth, mental health. Um, we're welcoming lots of refugees into the country now, which is fantastic. Uh, de dealing with the, there, and there's justice is such a broad, broad subject. So lots of different areas um, that we can go into. Uh, John was a he was a caring man. Um, as a lawyer, uh, you know lawyers do get a bad name. They're often they're they're thought of as slimy, uh, you know, out to get you, out for money. Uh, anyone that would know that would have ever met my father would would quickly decide determine that not the case with John. Uh, he was a lawyer that cared. He was a person that cared. Uh, he was always welcoming to anyone into our home, including his clients. Uh, if you were guilty, he made you plead guilty, and you suffered. You, you suffered the consequences of that. If you weren't guilty, he would he would fight for you. Uh, and he's fought at all levels of the court, um, all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, and often on his own on his own dime. He he didn't really care about the money. Uh, he he just cared about justice and about. Uh, about uh, making sure everybody got a fair shot. As a judge, he was uh, very compassionate to victims, uh, but equally compassionate to accused. Uh, he made sure to give them, always gave people a chance at a fair trial, which is very important to him. Uh, our Canadian Charter of Rights was, it, you know, it was, it was top of the list for him. He, was, he made sure that that, that was respected. Uh, so to the, to the speakers tonight, uh, you know, I applaud your, your courage. Uh, it's, you know, it's not always easy to come up uh, and talk in front of your peers, uh, especially about, the, about this topic. Uh, you know, it's, I think you, 
be sharing ideas that uh, you know are likely very strong to you, uh, very important to you. So it's uh, once again I applaud your courage. Uh, and on behalf of the Friel family, uh, just like to thank everybody in the audience for coming uh, for what I hope to hope will be an inspiring night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friel. The annual John C. Friel X Talks were announced earlier this year by the Honorable Frank McKenna, another distinguished St. FX alumnus, in honor of Judge Friel, who was his brother-in-law. Mr. McKenna has established a permanent fund for the X Talk series within the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership to support the series on an ongoing basis in the years to come. This year's inaugural event, as Mr. Friel mentioned, is centered on the theme of justice to commemorate Mr. Friel's exemplary career. Rachel Blanc, the Students' Union Vice President Academic, or, excuse me, Activities and Events, has been another instrumental figure in coordinating the X Talk series. I now invite Rachel to the stage to speak briefly on the X Talks and tonight's theme as well. This is bright. This is hard. Ooh, hard eating butterflies. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing myself. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Rachel LeBlanc. Um, I'm originally from Ottawa, Ontario. I'm a third year uh, student studying economics and development studies at St. of X. Uh, clearly, as I shake, I am not one of the speakers tonight, but um, I have had the privilege of being the vice president of activities and events uh, for this past year. Um, so that has been phenomenal and has given me the opportunity to be able to help with this awesome, awesome event, this awesome, awesome opportunity to learn beyond the classrooms. So I'm going to speak a little bit about what X Talks is. X Talks is a, a lecture series that is driven by students. This stage that I'm standing on right now is designed to give students an opportunity to share their voice and their opinions and their battle and their story. That's what it's for. Because we realize that students come from all different walks of life. They come from all kinds of different places. They have different, different perspectives. And we have to celebrate that more uh, on our campus and do it in such an amazing place um, called Bauer Theater. So this is why we're having this event. Why justice? Well, upholding justice, as we've seen, is a collective effort that relies on those bold and brave enough to stand up and fight for it. It's not an easy battle. As we've seen, 2017 kicked off. It requires hours, even days, in protest and can sometimes put people's lives on the line. It is, however, undoubtedly the fight that keeps many of us alive today. So I really want to thank the speakers of tonight. We have Rebecca Masai, Jasmine Cormier, Clancy McDaniel, and Tarek Harad, speaking on justice in every realm, in every, from different perspectives. And I encourage you to sit here and take this in <coughs> and understand that there are going to be people who have different opinions, different perspectives, different stories that might conflict with your own view. And we should be at peace with that. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. So I'm going to let things go. I'm going to pass it back to Em. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, see you after. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the night. Rebecca Masai is in her second year at St. FX University and is studying political science and development studies. During her first year at St. FX, she was a part of the Social Justice Colloquium, a program that requires students to think critically about issues within their community and beyond. She has been involved with the Office for Students of African Descent and X Project, where she agitates for the voices and needs of minority students to become a part of primary university discourse. She is also a part of the Young Women's Empowerment Society and the Women's and Gender Studies Student Societies. In April 2016, Rebecca was chosen as one of four students to be a part of the McKenna Youth Leaders Exchange in Haiti, where she learned about youth activism and grassroots development. After completing a directed study on intersectional and feminist leadership in Haiti, Rebecca presented her findings to the Hive for Feminist Research, marking the first time a student presented to this group. 
This past year, Rebecca, along with three of her colleagues, established the Academic Success for All program for student athletes. Rebecca continues to work toward greater equity and social justice at all levels of student life at St. FX. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca for the delivery of her X talk entitled The Dangerous Silence of Conformity. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to be here on the inauguration of the John C. Friel X Talks. I'm so excited to talk to you guys all about my understanding of justice and by extension, our collective understanding of justice. Now, Emily has already done a very good job of recognizing that we are on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We have to understand that these came through the treaties of peace and reconciliation signed by the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet, along with the British Crown, that continue to establish and to outline the ongoing relationship between nations that we enjoy today. Seeing as it is also going to be African Heritage Month in February, I would also like to recognize that we are standing also on the territory of the African Nova Scotians, who have called this land their home for the last 300 years. I'm especially grateful to these two communities because I understand that it is through their pain and their displacement that I've had the opportunity to pursue an education here at St. FX, so I would like to thank them. Now allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Rebecca Masai, and I am the proud immigrant child of refugees. After everything that my parents went through, they ensured that they knew the incredible amount of privilege my siblings and I had in growing up in Canada. They always told us, don't you ever take the opportunities that you have in this country for granted, because we never had them. They were also exceptionally brave and courageous, and they always, without fail, would intervene in situations that they deemed to be unjust or unacceptable much to my own mortification growing up. I once made the mistake of asking my mother, why is it you always have to say something? And she said to me, well, if I don't say, any, if I don't say anything, who do you expect will? And my father added to that. He said, what exactly are you afraid of? In a world like we live in, in one as dangerous as this one, you cannot afford to not speak out. You won't lose anything by saying something. But by staying quiet, you allow that injustice to take place again and again. Needless, today, needless to say, in a few years' time, I would soon be the source of my friends and my siblings' mortification as I spoke out on every opportunity. When I first came to St. FX, I experienced a number of shocks. One of the first being what I perceive to be the utter lack of diversity of the university population. The second was the extent to which and the manner in which university students consumed alcohol, something I found is common in all universities, who would have thought? And the third was the culture of conformity, upon which I had witnessed on many occasions, even within my first month at St. FX. I believe this is in part because we are a small town in rural Nova Scotia, and we're a very concentrated and energetic group of people with only a few activities available to us outside of the university campus. However, I also believe that this has in part to do with the homogeneity of the university population. I found this to be especially true when we were examining both the race and the social class of the vast majority of the students who decided to come here. I mean, it was the first time I'd met so many people with the same last name that were not related. <laughs> many of the people who come to St. FX are often of the second or third generation in their families to do so. And certainly the tradition of St. FX is one to be celebrated and one to talk about. However, for those people like myself who are the first in their families to come to St. FX, it can often be very daunting and intimidating to constantly talking about this. I often like to describe my first few months at St. FX as a diaspora experience. For those of you who may not be familiar with the word diaspora, it is the establishment of a group of people 
in a land or territory that are not their ancestral lands or territories. Now, I understand the irony in me, a real life diaspora, in saying this to you, but allow me to contextualize. When I first came to St. FX, I found that I could not identify with the mainstream, meaning the white Canadian culture that I found myself so utterly surrounded by. I am, as I mentioned previously, the immigrant kid of Ethiopians, and I was raised in a very Ethiopian household, despite having grown up in Canada. And for this reason, I found I could not relate to a lot of the behaviors that were exhibited by my peers and really had no interest in joining in. This being said, I did not entirely fit in with all my international student friends because it seemed to me that they had this understanding a wisdom that I, by virtue of having grown up in a place that had shielded me from the harshest realities of the world, had yet to attain. So here I was, one decade after having found my niche in the northeast of Calgary among my kindred, feeling as though I was once again eight years old, a feeling of culture shock and of displacement and one that many of my international student friends had come up to me and expressed on many occasions. See, whereas I had 18 years of living in a place that did not reflect me and where I didn't see people like myself reflected wherever I go, they for the first time were living in a place where the dominant culture was not their own. So where did it leave us? Those of us who could not conform by factors that were completely out of our control. Why is it that an institution that had existed for 200 years had created this mold of what a student was supposed to be, but nobody had questioned it or asked why it existed in that sense for so long? And why is it that this happened so easily that we were feeling othered to the extent that the video We Are Saying FX was released without even one visible minority in its video? The danger of conformity is this. It works insidiously. It does not make people question what is directly in front of them. It allows individuals to hide their identity in a larger group so they do not have to take responsibility for their actions. And it keeps them from posing questions, from asking. Because that's how it's always been. And that's how it'll always be. So why bother? This type of mentality is especially troubling on a university campus. It is our role as an academic institution to question what is happening in greater society, to create solutions, and then to try and overcome these challenges. It is only the idea of accountability that can destroy the idea of conformity and then allow to create a path that will then agitate for justice. I believe firmly that who we are today in this moment is a result of how we grew up, of the experiences that we've had, and in the decisions that we've made. I also believe that these are the elements that will most influence our own and our personal understandings of what justice is and what a just environment will look like, and then how this will manifest itself each and every day. Like I said, St. FX has been in existence for nearly 200 years, and it is only through our own action that we can push for a more just and equitable campus. As a university, we need to stop being compliant, and we must be willing to examine the dark spots in our history. We must admit where we were and where we are at fault. And this is especially true when we're talking about having reconciliation between our Mi'kmaq and our African Nova Scotian communities. And as students, we have to be challenged to stop conforming to this idea of what the university wants us to be, and instead make the university conform to the idea of what we want and what we will it to be. The first step, I believe, is to say this out loud. I'll go first. In my mind, St. FX will be a place where I'm reflected in and among my peers, my professors, and the university administration without a mirror, where I will not feel more displaced at my rightful spot at a scholarship dinner than I do on a court, even though I don't play basketball, 
where I won't have to combat questions about why my hair is so curly and why I speak English so well. Where my friends who come from different countries are not asked if they live in mud huts and in straw houses. Where I can jog past any building on this campus without fear of hearing, run nigger run, yelled after me. Because that happens. A place where I can be the black, Swedish, Ethiopian, Canadian feminist that I am with an Afro or braids depending on my choice. And I can be all of this proudly, unapologetically, and without even the smallest hint of worry. This is my definition of justice. Thank you. Next up, we have Jasmine Cormier. Jasmine Cormier is a third year women's and gender studies major from Pictou County. Planning on pursuing a career in journalism, Jasmine's interests include feminism and pop culture. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine to the stage for her X Talk, A Difficult Conversation. <coughs> Before I begin, I'd like to give a brief warning that this talk contains sensitive material concerning, concerning sexualized violence. If it becomes too overwhelming, you're welcome to leave. Certainly no one will judge you. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't going to be emotional, but I wore my Hillary Clinton shirt and I don't want her to see me cry. <laughs> my name is Jasmine Cormier. You might be familiar with the article I wrote last semester concerning the choice of the Maple League universities to host Marie Hennen, nicknamed in her field of criminal law, Hannibal Lecter. This article started a national conversation about freedom of speech, which would be amazing if that was actually what I was talking about. I wouldn't be able to do this talk without acknowledging my criticisms, so to the people who believe that the safety of survivors of sexualized violence is less important than free speech, you're wrong. But I can say that because it's freedom of speech. At times, these comments can seem overwhelming, but like New Brunswick Reddit user PM Mir Vaj says, you just gotta laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Another point of controversy my Hennen article brought up was that university students are crybaby cupcakes that want safe spaces. To that, I can only say this. Someone had a free enough space to sexually assault me. Many others had a free space to ignore it. So I demand a free space to talk about it, a safe space to talk about that and what it means openly. The theme for these talks is justice, and a lot of the time when we think of justice, we think of legal justice, but justice comes in many other forms. When questioning whether to use the word victim or survivor, when speaking or writing about sexual violence, I came across several pieces of writing defending either the former or the latter. One day, I finally realized that I am both and that my justice lies in the days that I am a survivor. When I wrote the article, I never expected to achieve national headlines. I did, however, expect that writing the article would leave me feeling re-victimized, hurt, and scared. I was not disappointed. I was told that I was using my own personal traumas to attack beloved Hannibal, I mean Marie Hennen. One Facebook commenter wrote, have the difficult conversation, it's worth it. Well, let's see if that's true. Mark Bazanson, this is for you. When I was in my first year, I'm now in my third, I was sexually assaulted at a party by a person I'd never met before that night. It was the day of a school event and I had been drinking since around two in the afternoon. My total for the day was eight Rockstar vodkas, a flaming shot of 151, and a caffeine pill. By the time I got to the events after party, I was a hot mess. But in my first year, I was always a hot mess, so it wasn't much different from any other night. At one point, I had, in, I had been interrupted in the bathroom with my assailant, whom I mentioned before during an intimate moment by my best friend, Sarah. Sarah's actually working the visuals right now. Um, she's my roommate and my best friend, and she is the Louise to my Thelma and has been ever since that night. After she came in, he motioned for me to leave with him. I said no, because now my friend was here, and hanging out with her would be way more fun than anything I was doing with him. Later that night, Sarah was on her way out, and this boy was on his way downstairs, so I decided to go downstairs too. Sarah asked if I was sure and if I wanted to. I said yes. When we got to this bedroom in a house I'd never been in before, I laid down on the bed and I froze. I wasn't unconscious, I wasn't falling asleep, I was simply frozen. 
but I could hear him trying to motivate me to continue, come on, come on. To describe what happened to me without going into intense detail, I'll just say that there were definite attempts at oral penetration. And let's just say that this boy must have seen the Donald Trump Billy Bush tapes long before they'd ever been leaked. All of this happened whilst I was non-responsive. After this initial incident, every moment that has proceeded has been an opportunity for either victimization or survival. There was a loud banging at the door. He got up to answer. Now two men I had never met before stood at the doorway staring back at me, now slumped off the bed. Were they both going to come in now? Was this planned? These were the real thoughts forming in my head at the time. I got enough courage to run upstairs, to grab my phone and run upstairs. I immediately found a friend I'd known from home. I rambled over and over, now in a frantic state, that he wouldn't stop, he just wouldn't stop. All I could hear in the room around me was laughter. Getting more scared and upset, I grabbed my jacket from on top of the fridge and I headed towards the door. Then I noticed an RA had followed me to the door and was going to walk back to campus with me. We got to campus and she returned to her residence and I was alone to walk back to my own. The reality set in that once again, I was a victim, a statistic, the butt of a joke. I texted Sarah only alluding to the fact that something had happened and she told me to come sleep in her bed. I walked into her residence, tears running down my face, past campus security. They motioned to check my bracelet, realized I was upset and said nothing. No are you okays, no questions asked. That night I cried myself to sleep in Sarah's bed. Sarah is not good with emotions and trauma and comforting but she did it anyway. Ever since I was a teenager, my mom always had to tell me to stop oversharing such personal details, and obviously I'd never listened. The next morning, I started to write a message to the RA who had walked me home. I told her that I didn't remember much of what had happened because I thought that made my story more believable. Isn't it funny how victims feel compelled to lie because they're afraid they might not be believed? I mean, what kind of world would we be living in if someone could open up about their deepest, darkest, most vulnerable moments, and the first thoughts coming to the listener's ears is that they are lying? I was told that any time I needed to talk, I was welcome. I had a similar encouragement in a personal email from our university's president after being widely criticized in the national media. In both instances, please get help if you need to, felt like, talk to anyone but me, please reach out to anyone but me, and I don't blame either of them. Sexual assault is a sensitive topic, but we need to work together to change the stigma. Some might see me talking about this so openly as inappropriate, but the only thing I find inappropriate is that it happened in the first place. At first you feel alone until you share your story with someone who shares their own with you, but eventually those stories that you hear from your drunk friend in the bathroom at a party start to pile up. And you realize that there is something fundamentally wrong with the society we're living in. I could show you statistics, but whether it's one in three or one in four women who will become a victim to sexualized violence or whatever the probability may be, the truth is that sexualized violence affects everyone. Some much more than others, but still everyone. The truth is that we go to a university where sexualized violence happens every day, every minute, every hour, and in multiple forms. Microaggressions, rape jokes, Marie Hennen. Every choice we make surrounding sexualized violence, every word spoken, every tradition upheld, every difficult conversation is an opportunity to make someone either a victim or a survivor. We can whack the truth out of survivors that are doing their best to protect themselves in an effort to undermine them and our institutions can host people who share and spread such values while masquerading as a safe space, or we can light the way for the all too many people who are suffering from the tragedy that is sexualized violence. This is something that happened to me years ago that I've since, in a way, gotten used to, but I can't get used to the fact that it's happening to so many others. What we can do as students and as people is hold our institution accountable for the fact that sexualized violence happens here. Rules and policies are a great, much needed step forward, but we need to change the fundamental idea of what sexual assault is by changing the assumption that sexual violence is a masked man waiting for us in the bushes on our way home to the reality that these are acts committed by real people who have real beliefs that they are entitled to another person's body. Understand that while many people have friends who are survivors, many others also have friends, acquaintances, colleagues that are perpetrators, and we must hold perpetrators accountable for their actions to ensure they do not repeat their actions and in the best of scenarios are punished by the full extent of the law. A line in the sexual violence policy reads that the so-called consequences are not a substitute for the judiciary system. Well, we know how the legal system treats survivors, and I hold myself, 
you all, and our university to a higher standard than a system that fundamentally distrusts women. I believe victims and survivors. Do you? Our next speaker is Clancy McDaniel. Clancy is 20 years old and in her second year studying sociology and development studies. On campus, she serves as a resident assistant in McIsaac Hall and will become the hall director of Cameron Hall next year. She is also secretary of the Jack.org chapter and is involved in the Model UN Society. During the summer, Clancy works with the Tim Hortons Children's Foundation in Campbellsville, Kentucky where her passion for justice became contextualized in the lives of children who will forever hold her heart. She champions causes related to poverty, equity and equality, and violence against women. Please join me in welcoming Clancy to the stage to deliver her ex-talk entitled, From Bystander to Torchbearer, Owning Injustice. Good evening, everyone. My name is Clancy McDaniel, and I'm a second year sociology and development studies student here at St. of X. I grew up in Cape Breton with my three siblings and loving parents in what I consider to be a typical East Coast upbringing. I also consider myself to be a typical student. My favorite day of the week is Tuesday because it's discount day at the grocery store. I have a gourmet pantry of Mr. Noodles and Katie cups in my room at the ready and I don't think I've ever walked up the Nicholson Hall stairs without getting winded. I'm a sister, a daughter, a friend, an employee, but I'm also an abduction survivor. Now when you first saw me standing on this stage, I most likely did not look like the face of the global human trafficking epidemic. This is because we have created a dangerous dialogue in which human trafficking occurs in other countries, other cities, and quote unquote scary places. This rhetoric is problematic because it disregards my experience and the experience of others within our border. According to an article posted by the Globe and Mail, the RCMP have identified that 94% of the cases of human trafficking they have dealt with have been domestic. Nova Scotia laid their first conviction of human trafficking this past December, and there have been 35 convictions nationwide since 2005. There have been over 1,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada since 1980, and a study conducted by the Canadian Foundation for Women estimates that 50% of all trafficked persons in Canada are Indigenous. I'd always consider myself aware but I never thought that I would be kidnapped. And that is because I lived in the privilege of this not being my reality. I too was living in a bubble and ignoring what was really going on in our country. I would read articles and watch documentaries that would stir a certain anger inside of me, but that would become ultimately defeated because really, what could I do? Every day we read the news or we watch a video and it seems as if we are inundated with the injustices with this world. It's hard for survivors to feel justified in coming forward when privilege and a spot on a top university swim team can buy a three month sentence for rape. The truth is, as someone who has faced violent crime, I never felt as if our so-called justice system could do anything to help me or my family or to protect me from my perpetrators. I was a small fish in a much larger pond of the powers that be. 24 hours after my disappearance, I was rescued by a horde of SWAT team members, but their shields and batons gave me no comfort. Their disdainful gaze and the questions about my sexual and drinking patterns all added up to the conclusion that I was ultimately responsible for my fate, not the man who pumped cocaine ecstasy, Xanax, Percocets, Oxycontin, marijuana, and alcohol into my system, all of which was treated with a single Valium and a five-hour stay in hospital because 
someone else could have used my bed. I was also told how lucky I was that I had been able to contact my friend, but what they had left out was their refusal to help her, their refusal to file a missing person's case until after 72 hours in which I had been missing, during which time I would have been sold into prostitution or dead. They instantly assigned me a number as yet another missing woman in Canada. Every day, victims of injustice are systematically told that they do not matter and that they are not supported. As you can imagine, this created significant impairments within my life. I internalized the dialogue that I was disposable and began to treat myself as such. But what changed my mindset for me to be able to stand here today was the shift in my thinking of the meaning of justice itself. And this came through the most unlikely medium, summer camp. As mentioned, I spend my summers working with the Tim Hortons Children's Foundation in Campbellsville, Kentucky. If you're unaware of the work that the foundation completes, we provide children who come from low-income families the opportunity to go to camp for a life-changing 10 days, all expenses paid. At camp, we focus on eight values, including peace, relationships, and teamwork, values that I believe can be incorporated into all of our daily lives. The children I have the joy of working with come from areas such as the Bronx, Detroit, and Buffalo, and are no strangers to injustice. In their short lives, many of these children come to experience an even more pronounced, systematic message that they do not matter. As such, many children act out in a desperate call for attention. I may have internalized my disposability for several months, but this was their daily reality. What amazed me, however, is what happened when for the first time, these children finally had a champion. Someone to listen to them, someone to cheer them on, someone to validate their feelings, hopes, dreams, and ultimately existence after a lifetime of the opposite. These kids trans transform between my eyes into something that I would consider self-confident leaders, healing my heart in the process. It taught me that maybe justice isn't a judge in a robe, a 10-month sentence, or an executive order. Justice is when you stop asking what you cannot do and start asking what you can. Justice is treating others with kindness and respect, offering a platform for others to share their voices and their stories, and taking the time to actually listen. Justice is also about finding peace with those who have wronged you in order for you to do better yourself. Every person in this room has a story. We have all experienced injustice, hurt, and sorrow in our own ways. And it's so easy to drown in the sea of bad news and to fall back on the idea that there is simply nothing we can do. But in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., every man of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits their convictions. But we all must protest. You do not have to single-handedly end a war to make a difference. Justice is all in how we treat each other. If we are understanding, sincere, and kind in our actions, think of the impact this could have on the person who is silently struggling beside you and on society as a whole. The small pieces add to the bigger puzzle and ultimately the bigger picture. And you may never truly know the difference you could be making in the lives of one another. I personally have seen the difference Something as small as three square meals, singing until your lungs are sore, and endless laughter can make in an entire generation. I encourage everyone here to make it their mission to reflect on their own stories, take ownership of them, become involved, become knowledgeable, and spread that knowledge amongst each other. This is how we can execute our own definition of justice, because I believe while ignorance may be bliss, knowledge is power. Thank you. 
Our final speaker of the evening is Tarek Haddad. Tarek moved to Canada in December 2015 as a Syrian newcomer. He studied medicine at Damascus University and proceeded to join the medical relief efforts for the Syrian refugees with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the World Health Organization through a local organization when he arrived to Lebanon in 2013 as a refugee himself. Passionate about peace and youth entrepreneurship, he and his family started their company, Peace by Chocolate, in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, to sponsor peace building projects and support the local economy. They now employ several people. The company turned into a phenomenon that inspired people around the world. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau himself spoke about Peace by Chocolate at the UN Summit in September 2016 in New York, noting that it is a remarkable example of contributions of newcomers in their communities. Tarek is also trying to complete his med medical degree here in Canada. He is now working on his Bachelor of Science here at St. FX. Grateful for encouragement and support from his new community, he is now also more involved in public speeches, media campaigns, and interviews to support youth entrepreneurial skills, as well as raising awareness about Syrian youth and Syrian refugees all around the world. Please join me in welcoming Tarek for his presentation of social justice from newcomers' perspectives. Well, let me start by asking you a question. This is my habit. I usually love, you know, to start by asking questions. Who thinks himself a rich or a super rich man? Please raise your hand. <laughs> so who thinks his parents are super rich or just they have lots of money? Please raise your hand. Well, I know that you came from Christmas, you know, your bucket was full of money, you know, so. And the last question, who thinks any of his ancestors, sorry, excuse, excuse me, because I love really to know whose ancestors were really rich when they came here to Canada. Okay, so coming back to Syria, when I was asking that question to the people that I knew, when I was asking who is rich and who is vulnerable, I just recognized that is, there is a huge gap, you know, in the Syrian community between the vulnerable people and the super rich people. I understand justice. It's just the equality of distribution of resources. When I was in my family, there are people who are billionaires. But on the other hand, in Syria, there are people who couldn't find you know, their, the money to find to eat their daily food, or to go to the grocery stores, or to go to the BHCs, to the primary healthcare centers, to go to the hospitals to treat their children. That was inequality. That was just because Syria was a dictatorship that was ruled by ignorant people, that they couldn't know that Syria, it's in the, mid, in the Middle East, you know, say they, they stereotyped, you know, that case on the Syrians. They said, it's, it's normal, you know, to find like 1% of the Syrians, they own around 80%, you know, of the resources in the community. They were telling me that, but I couldn't believe that. This is not a human. This is really killing, you know, the, the people who are really fighting to get their daily food for their children. Since we left Syria in 2011 and we became refugees in Lebanon, I understood the justice in a different way when I became refugee. When we arrived, when we passed the Lebanese borders and became refugees, and my father asked me, where shall we go now? I said, I don't know. We went to the refugee camp. After one month, we were registered in the United Nations as refugees. And being a refugee in Lebanon means that you lost your home, you lost your dreams, you lost everything you were preparing for you and your siblings and everybody in your family to live. Being a refugee means you lost the, the most important thing in your life, your sense of belonging. Being a refugee in Lebanon means that we became numbers. I went to the United Nations to get registered there, and they told me that, what's your number? 
I said, my name is Tarek. They said, no, we are asking you about your number. I said, I'm not a number. I'm a human being. I just left my home before a month. I just lost my dreams before a month. I couldn't just come as a number, totally alone. This is not my choice. I was forced to leave my country. This is exactly what does it mean to live in a community that there is no social justice means that you live in Lebanon and every time I was going out I had to speak in a Lebanese accent because if I spoke in a Syrian accent in the streets you know this type of discrimination you know this type of of like you are not welcomed anymore in, in that community I had to speak in a different accent because I'm Syrian is that how we are as human beings we are in the 21st century how we should live even if we became refugees, if there is anything happened in our country and forced us to leave any time, I then, I then left, you know, and I, I said that I could do anything. I joined the United Nations, and I was doing everything I could just to help the refugees to live in a social justice situation because I said that's enough. I, I said that's enough to hear my siblings screaming in the tent that divides them on the, on the outside by just a few millimeters when the degree in Bikavale in Lebanon became minus 10 in winter. So I said to myself, no, I can do something. I can just go and initiate. I joined the United Nations and I was helpless Syrians there. Then I went to the Canadian embassy and here the story started. Since the time I entered the, the Canadian embassy in Beirut, the first thing I was given is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom. The Canadians believe in their embassies that anybody should visit the embassy should know that the Canada is, stands for just freedom and human rights. After that, a royal flight was booked for me and my family when the campaign started to bring the Syrian refugees to this country. And I flew from Lebanon to Canada. And when I arrived to Toronto Airport, what does it mean to, to live in a social justice? I was welcomed in Toronto Airport in a way of two rows of Canadian officers. They were welcoming me and saying, welcome to Canada. This is your country. This is a new homeland. I felt myself living in a social justice means that if you are a newcomer, came to a new country, you feel yourself as I'm the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> My family came with me. We had no idea what we will face in this country. We had no idea how the system is working here. We had no idea if we will meet you know welcoming people if, or if we will be rejected or isolated in a, a community by the way we didn't choose to live in Antigonish Antigonish just picked us <laughs> and when I arrived in Halifax airport they told me that you are traveling to Antigonish and I said you know what is that I googled it you know and <laughs> I found it difficult even to find it on Google you know <laughs> <laughs> after that I found it finally and I drove three hours from Halifax airport we arrived here finally and we found that the Canadian community in this town is the most welcoming community on earth. And I started to understand justice, the social justice, by two things. The first, justice by equality. Wherever I am now in Canada, I am dealt as any Canadian citizen in this country. Nothing different, nothing different, wherever I am, at the hospitals, at the grocery stores, in the streets, at the libraries, doing public speeches, you know, more than Canadians. <laughs> I understood that being a newcomer, even if I left my home country, and everybody from you should know that he's a newcomer in, in a way in his life. We are newcomers if we are newcomers to love, if we are newcomers to, to the university, we are newcomers to a new society, if we left our towns to another town. We are newcomers if we got married. We are newcomers in any way. If, even if you, if you read a new book, you will become a newcomer to that book. I understood that this country really stands for these values of freedom and equality. 
since we arrived here, huge opportunities were offered to us. And this is the social justice by offering opportunities. Since the time that we came to this country, and everybody told us that you are Canadians. What does it mean? It means that you are confident to succeed in your new, new home country, even if you are a stranger. We felt, we felt that we will be in a different country. We traveled 7,000 kilometers from the Middle East to here with no idea about what we will face. Offering opportunities to newcomers can help them to succeed, and that's exactly what happened with my family when my father asked me, we lost everything that I have been building since 40 years, and you too. I was supposed now to be practicing medicine as a physician in a Syrian hospital. I finished my degree. My father said, what shall we, what shall we do now in, in this country? We ended the first month. That was in February 2016. Everybody in Antigonish, because they believe that this is the country, everybody should live equal. They came to us, 50 people from Antigonish, they applied when we asked for help to rebuild our business. They came, you can't imagine that business counselors, carpenters, everybody could help in anything to rebuild our factory, came and helped us. That made us so confident that we are in the real country, we are in the country that respect everybody has came here you know, with experiences and with skills. We maybe lost everything. We thought that we would start from zero, like any newcomer, like any refugee. But we didn't. We started more over than zero. I just realized also social justice before two weeks. I was in Montreal. And I was planning to go to the United States. People there, they invited me, the governor of Vermont, he said, we are really impressed by your story, by peace, by chocolate story, and we believe that the United States now needs to hear that story. I was in Montreal, I rent a car, and I drove to the borders. That was after Mr. Trump's inauguration by one day, it was on Sunday. When I arrived at the borders, the first question I was asked, where are you from? Even if I had the visa, I had the permanent resident card, I had everything I needed. They asked me the first question, where are you from? It's, it was not in a kind way. They really cared where I am from. And when I told them that I'm from Syria, it was a horror movie. I'm not going to tell you what happened because it's 7 p.m., you know, it should be in the morning. So I really understood then that there are people in, in, in the, on this planet, they care where the others are from because to ban them, to deal with them differently, even if I'm from Syria, why are you are asking me why I'm from Syria? I'm, I'm different than anybody else. I'm, I breathe like anybody else. I eat like anybody else. I move like anybody else. I work like anybody else in this country. Why you are asking me where I'm from? When I came to Canada, nobody asked me at the airport, where are you from? The first sentence we hear was, welcome to Canada. And nobody in Toronto airport, when I arrived, he said, if you are from Syria, you are banned from this country. No, they received us with flowers at the airport. Finally, to this country that offered us just to live in a democratic, social justice, in a happy community, to be equal like anybody else, we have nothing to deal with it, even with respect and love. And the, th and the, the second thing, we face problems as newcomers, but because of the social justice that is available here in this community, we felt ourselves like Canadians. The third thing and the last thing, we really believe that our home is freedom and our heart is full of peace. Thank you so much. Lastly, 
before we conclude with this evening's presentation, I'll invite Mary Coyle, the Executive Director of the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Emily. Wow, what tough acts to follow. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much, uh, Tarek, Clancy, Jasmine, Rebecca, you guys really kicked off this inaugural John C. Friel <coughs> X-Talk series in, in a way that I could have never imagined. So thank you for everything you did here tonight. <laughs> Thanks also to all of you for coming out in such great numbers and with such open hearts and, uh, and such enthusiasm uh, as we came together to hear the voices of these four remarkable St. Evex students. So thank you all for being with us here tonight. I'd like to also thank uh, the co-hosts for this evening. As, as you know, I'm with the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership. And our role on this campus is to help promote uh, student leadership help students to discover the leadership they have within them and help them develop that. Well, working hand in hand with our students union, and many of our student union leaders are here tonight, uh, with of course, you, you, you heard from Rachel earlier, uh, the student union have been fantastic uh, leaders and partners in this and bringing forth the talents of their peers. Working also with the Zaverian Weekly, I love the way the Zaverian uh, and you, Emily, and the whole crew have stepped up this year in a very interesting role on our campus, not just putting out a newspaper, but convening important conversations. And so thank you, Emily, and the crew from the Zaverian Weekly. And aren't we fortunate to be here tonight in this beautiful Bauer Theater, the home of Theater Anaganish and Festival Anaganish. They've welcomed us, the campus, in here, and we're, this place is full of St. of X tonight, and our community coming together in a wonderful way. I'd like to thank Andrea, I'd like to thank Rima, I'd like to thank Ian, I'd like to thank Tori, who's out there at the bar waiting for all of you. I'd like to thank the whole crew here at the Bower for their partnership this evening as well. So, so those are my, my thanks for the evening. Uh, I'm not going to be up here for very much longer, just have two more things to say. And that the, first, the, the first of those two things is that Frank McKenna, uh, who's the brother-in-law, as we heard earlier, of, uh, of John C. Friel, and who's uh, one of our illustrious alumni, and, and whose name is on the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership. When I talk with Frank about what he wants to see happen through the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership, he says, I want to see good conversations stimulated. Well, I would say these four speakers tonight have really done a fabulous job in stimulating our intellects and hopefully <coughs> igniting a conversation that will go on afterwards in the green room and then for the weeks and months and years to come. So thank you so much again. 